Basketball is special. The size of the court and the lack of pads or helmets give fans the most intimate experience of a team sport that exists. And because of the different styles that basketball allows for, players develop their own distinct identities and signature styles through their creativity, flair, and athleticism. And although no player succeeds alone, the scoring volume and two-way nature of the sport give individual stars a nearly unprecedented amount of control over the flow and outcome of a game. For this reason, players are constantly compared to their peers and to the legends of the past in order to answer the most hotly contested question in the sport. Who's the greatest to ever do it? For many, the question is redundant. They believe in only one right answer, their answer. Others might have their own personal stance, but acknowledge one or two alternatives. But I believe that there's much more nuance to the question of greatness and more answers to it than you might think. By my count, there are eight players in NBA history that have a substantial claim as the GOAT. It's a subjective thing though. I can't give you a definitive answer. All I can do is make the argument. So today, I'll be making the case for Tim Duncan as the greatest basketball player of all time. I know what you're thinking. No way. There's no chance Tim Duncan is the GOAT. He's not even the best player of his generation, you might say. You're thinking there's no way Tim Duncan belongs in the same company as some of the other players that I'll talk about in this series. And if you believe that, there's probably three things you'll bring up as I make this argument. Number one, his second act. If you're the kind of person who rates players through spreadsheets, his career in the 2010s is statistically underwhelming. Number two, his peak. You might say that Duncan never had a real peak where he was the most dominant player in the league night in and night out like Shaq was. And number three, Greg Popovich. Duncan has always had Pop, arguably the greatest coach of all time, in his corner. I hear you, and I promise to address those throughout this video as they become relevant. For now, let's do what we do with every other basketball player when we talk about them historically and look at Duncan's numbers. Here are the notable accolades from his NBA career. His five championships are more than Larry Bird or Will Chamberlain. His 15 all-defensive selections are the most of anybody ever. His 15 all-star appearances are tied for third all-time. He has as many regular season MVPs as Kobe and Shaq combined, and only Michael Jordan has more finals MVPs. Don't forget about his college accomplishments though, because remember, Duncan came out of Wake Forest after four years, despite people like Jerry West who said he could have been the number one overall pick had he left after his sophomore year. Instead, by the end of his collegiate career, he was a three-time Defensive Player of the Year, two-time ACC Player of the Year, two-time Consensus All-American, and was the National Player of the Year his senior season. And by the time he heard his name called on draft night, he was college basketball's all-time leader in rebounds. This snapshot of his basketball career should be enough to have him at the table of the GOAT conversation. You're not totally sold though. We need more numbers. To look at his career further, we should examine his place on some of the all-time leaderboards. Here's where he ranks all-time in some of the major statistical categories. There's some impressive stuff here, but for the most part, it doesn't really jump off the page at you. His career totals are substantially less impressive than other players at his position, like Kevin Garnett, Karl Malone, or Dirk Nowitzki. And that's because you can't judge Tim Duncan's numbers like you can with most players. Imagine, in 15 years, if somebody said to you that Russell Westbrook was better than Steph Curry, citing how many points, assists, and rebounds Westbrook had. You'd laugh, right? Because you know that numbers don't always tell the full story. Yeah, Steph Curry has impressive numbers, but Westbrook's are unbelievable. It would be impossible and irresponsible of me to talk about these players without mentioning the data that exists with them. But, by measuring players purely by their basketball reference page, you're leaving out the context and the story in which those numbers were achieved. That context is what makes those numbers meaningful and it's what makes basketball worth following. Such is the case with Tim Duncan, whose success and greatness transcend a box score. You can't judge Tim Duncan with numbers alone. The fact of the matter is that if you ran a team and you could pick from any NBA player to ever play the game, and your goal was to set your team up for success, you would pick Tim Duncan. For one, you have his play on the court, and we are going to talk about some numbers here for a little while. Offensively, he was dominant through the first 10 years of his career. From 98 to 08, he averaged 21.6 points, 11.8 rebounds, and 3.1 assists, while playing on one of the slowest teams in the league. 
In that span, his teams never once ranked in the top half of the league for pace. If you adjust his stats for pace and look at his numbers per 100 possessions, you're looking at a big man who was every bit as productive as any other offensive player in the league at the time. You already know about his skill set. He was, after all, the big fundamental. He could pass out of double teams, face up and break down the defense with surprising agility, consistently knock down shots from the elbows, and torch any big man in the league with his array of moves in the post and subtly imposing physicality. He could masterfully run a pick and roll with any guard with working limbs, and of course, he had his signature bank shot, one of the most consistent and reliable shots of all time, along with Kareem Skyhook and Dirk's fadeaway. Those skills never deteriorated throughout his career, save perhaps his final year. And that's where I want to tackle the idea that his second act was unexceptional. His scoring numbers dipped in his last eight years, where he never averaged over 20 points per game again. But, as the Spurs offense became more collaborative and free-flowing, Tony Parker and Manu Ginobili shouldered more of that scoring burden as Duncan aged. His shot attempts fell, though he remained efficient. His skills hadn't waned, the Spurs just didn't need him to score 28 points every night. He retained his role of alpha dog and contributed in other facets of the game. He could pick his spots, put his teammates in position to succeed, and save himself undue punishment and wear until it was needed. That's why, in 2013, at the age of 36, he became the oldest player ever named to first-team All-NBA. Duncan was never a prolific scorer, even in his prime. His game was never predicated on gaudy point totals like Malone or Dirk. With a different offense, he took fewer shots. With fewer shots, he scored fewer points. The whole time, though, he remained the whole package. He was a tremendous rebounder, the go-to guy in crunch time, and don't forget, the best defender, maybe ever. And that's what hurt his stats more than anything. The lack of flashy numbers for defense outside of blocks and steals. It's so hard to measure how much a drive was cut off because of his presence or a shot that was altered because of his contention. There are some advanced metrics that attempt to do this, and although it's an inexact science, stats like defensive rating, defensive win shares, and plus minus numbers do an admirable job of capturing the game's best ball stoppers. Duncan's place in those metrics is unmatched. These metrics, along with his 15 defensive selections, serve as a testament to how Duncan thrived when the opponent had the ball. Legendary basketball writer Jack McCallum wrote for SI after Duncan's retirement, Duncan guarded centers and power forwards, sometimes even small forwards, with equal success. And as the NBA became more and more of a high pick and roll game, Duncan accepted the extra responsibility of getting involved at the perimeter while never abandoning basket responsibility. Nobody was better than Duncan at being both an advanced guard and the final fortress. Nate Silver's 538, a website that works with data and statistical analysis in every realm from politics to sports, published this article by Neil Payne. In it, Payne collects several data points on offensive and defensive prowess in order to come up with a player's war value, or wins above replacement. In other words, how much better were you than an average player? Payne's war valued balance above all else, players who succeeded at both ends of the floor. Tim Duncan was the leader by a mile. What does all of this mean? It means that Tim Duncan was a tremendous offensive player despite the lack of volume and one of, if not the, greatest defenders of all time. In short, his value as a two-way player is virtually unmatched in the last 50 years of NBA basketball. All right, so enough with the numbers for right now. I wanna talk about Tim Duncan when it mattered the most, the playoffs. And I wanna use this time to dispute the idea that he doesn't belong in this conversation because he never had a transcendent peak. You can look at any numbers, read any article, talk to any fan who paid attention to the game at the time, and you'll come to the same conclusion. Tim Duncan was a killer in the playoffs. Nearly all of his most memorable performances came in the postseason, and more often than not, came in crucial games when his team needed him most. From his near quadruple double in 2003 to close out the Nets and earn his second championship, to his 25 point first half against the Heat in game six of the 2013 finals 10 years later, there was never a moment too big for Duncan. Here are some of his playoff rankings, significantly higher in almost every category than he is in the regular season. His 99 championship run was phenomenal, where he tore through a young Kevin Garnett, the newly assembled Kobe Shaq Lakers, Rasheed Wallace's Trailblazers, and the Patrick Ewingless eight seed Knicks on his way to being named the second youngest finals MVP ever. His 2002 campaign was incredibly underrated as he carried one of the worst teams of his career to 60 wins and outplayed Shaq before being beaten by the two-time champs. His 2003 season was his best season and we'll talk more about it in a second. 
just know that his running mate, David Robinson, averaged 8.5 points and 8 rebounds in the regular season, and that Duncan's win shares in that playoff run remain the most of anybody in a single postseason. In the mid to late 2000s, Duncan's Spurs remained a fixture in the playoffs against competition like Dirk's Mavs, Nash's Suns, and Kobe's Lakers. He repaid them with two more titles in 05 and 07. He also gave us one of the clutch shots of his career in Game 1 against the Suns in 2008 with this. O'Neal with the help, takes it to the basket, Duncan a three-pointer, puts it up, it's good! Like I said earlier, in Game 6 of the 2013 Finals, at age 36, playing against Wade, Bosch, and Apex LeBron on the road, Duncan put up 25 points in the first half. It would have gone down as an all-time series-clinching performance had it not been for... Catches, puts up the three, won't go, rebound Bosch, back out to Allen, his three-pointer, bang! Looking for revenge in the 2014 Finals, Duncan set the tone in Game 1 with a classic 21-10 game, while shooting 9 of 10 from the field. As his final playoff hurrah in 2015, trying to defend the title at the ripe age of 38 in Game 7 of a first-round series against the Clippers, Duncan reached all the way back and put up 27-11, and sinking crucial free throws to tie it before Chris Paul delivered this. The same Tim Duncan that was giving the business to a 22-year-old Kevin Garnett was the same Tim Duncan that was taking a 26-year-old DeAndre Jordan to school. He was ready to win championships from the day he entered the league to the day he left it. And I think that's why his peak is used against him as an argument here. The fact that his championship window lasted his entire 19-year career and that his teams were always somewhere between 50 and 60 wins meant that it's hard for any one of his seasons to stand out from the rest. And for some unfathomable reason, being consistently great is less of an accomplishment than being great for short stints. Like I said, his 2003 season was his best. After leading his team to 60 wins and his second consecutive MVP, Duncan eviscerated everything in his path as he tore through the playoffs. He upended the Suns, ended the Lakers' three-year reign as champions, and outdueled Dirk before absolutely torching the Nets in the finals. By the time he was holding the trophy, it was clear beyond a shadow of a doubt that Duncan was the league's best, most complete player. Here's what the Ringers' Chris Ryan had to say about 2003 Tim Duncan. We think about the Spurs now as this international house of aesthetically pleasing basketball. They were Terminators back then, and they were squeezing the life out of the game because they were just too good. They were too good. They were military in their precision. They were unflappable. They were dirty. And Duncan was the perfect avatar of all of it. You go back and watch him now, it's unbelievable the physical contact that he's absorbing in these series against New, New Jersey or whoever else was, they were playing against. And it was just routine that you'd see him put up 20 and 20s and barely break a sweat, much less a smile. I'd be lying if I said that Duncan's peak was higher than Shaq's. But I also wouldn't feel comfortable saying that the difference between the two is great enough for me to lose sleep over. To me, the truth is that Shaq was so much more of a spectacle. To watch peak Shaq was an experience unlike anything else. To see someone of his size and stature move so powerfully and fluidly is still something of a miracle. To see Duncan at the peak of his powers was a lot like seeing him seven or eight years later. He was just a little faster, a bit stronger, and a touch quicker. But do aesthetics denote superiority? I'd say no. And though Shaq in his prime was certainly a more dominant offensive player, there was never a time where he could match Duncan's abilities as a defender, leader, or a teammate. The two are the antithesis of each other. Shaq loves fame. Duncan loathes it. Shaq would sometimes show up to training camp out of shape, often battled with his co-stars, and finished his career having played for six different teams. Duncan took great care of his body, cemented himself as the cornerstone of his franchise, and is one of the most celebrated teammates in NBA history. Shaq left a little on the table. You could never say the same about Duncan. Shaq cared a little too much about what everyone thought about him, while Duncan couldn't have cared less. And while I'm at it addressing the points of criticism, let's go ahead and tackle Pop. Pop, to me, is the greatest coach there ever was but he would be the first one to tell you that he wouldn't be here without Tim Duncan. 
For one, Duncan can play any style of basketball, in any era. You want to go old school, slow pace, dump it off to the big man down low, let him bang, and be solid on defense? Titles. Remove the hand checking and illegal defenses, increase scoring, and start moving toward the perimeter? Titles. The league goes small ball, the pace explodes, and shooting and ball movement is more important than anything? The largest margin of victory in NBA Finals history. Second, he can play with any team. Honestly, has any superstar done more with less? Jordan had Pippen his entire run and Rodman for the last half. Bird had McHale and Parrish. Wilt had West and Hal Greer. Russell had Kuzi, Jones, and Havlicek. Magic had Kareem and vice versa. Kobe had Shaq and vice versa. And LeBron has had Wade, Kyrie, and Anthony Davis. Duncan's best teammates, old David Robinson, Tony Parker, and Manu Ginobili, combined for five third-team All-NBA appearances and four second-team appearances during their time with Duncan. Parker and Ginobili are long shots for the Hall of Fame, and even though Robinson's in it, you wouldn't say that he was playing at a Hall of Fame level alongside Duncan. Third and most importantly, Duncan forged the culture of the Spurs. Pop was essential in acquiring players and reinforcing the culture that Tim wanted, but Duncan was truly the most vital component. The NBA is a star-driven league, and finding a great player who hasn't gotten a coach fired is like finding a good Star Wars movie. They're few and far between. Not only did Duncan not get Pop fired, he let Pop coach him harder than any superstar ever. If Tim had ever thought to himself, you know what, I don't feel like getting my chops roasted in front of the whole team today because I didn't box out right in practice, he could have gone right to R.C. Buford and Pop would have been gone. End of story. But Tim understood what Pop was about and trusted him enough to be mentored in an unprecedented way. He set the example for his teammates that no one is immune to criticism and that it's expected of everyone to leave their egos at the door. In 2017, the Spurs SB Nation blog Pounding the Rock spoke to Sam Walker, author of The Captain Class, a book which examines winning culture in sports, from field hockey to rugby. In an exchange, Walker said this, the book's main conclusion is that the only one factor that must be present in order to maintain greatness over a long period of time is the presence of a particular kind of selfless, relentless, independent-minded, publicity-averse, emotionally composed captain with strong communication skills. And that's Duncan. Duncan was a pure example of the species. I love Pop, but I have to believe that Tim Duncan was the catalyst that empowered Pop to be what he is now. This isn't Belichick Brady where you wonder who made who. Pop is the greatest coach of all time because of Tim Duncan. If you want to try to take credit away from Duncan by saying that he played for the best teams, you might be right, but only because he made them the best team. He gave up touches, let other guys hold the torch, put everyone around him in the best position to succeed, and he enjoyed it when they did. When I said earlier that the thing that hurt Duncan's stats more than anything was a lack of defensive numbers, I lied. The thing that hurt Duncan's stats more than anything was the fact that he never gave a shit about stats or awards. Ever. He wanted his teams to succeed and he wanted to win. That's it. Just listen to the way his teammates talk about him. I don't think there's a more beloved teammate than Tim Duncan. In the words of NBA Commissioner Adam Silver, his understated selflessness made him the ultimate teammate. He was always the big brother, correcting them when they made mistakes and throwing his arm around their shoulders when things didn't go their way. He led in the most effective way possible, not with subtweeting, bombastic words, or showy halftime speeches, but by example. Of all the end of career farewell wishes, this is the one that stuck out to me the most. From his former teammate, Brent Bones Berry. He quoted Mark Twain saying, to be good is noble, but to show others how to be good is nobler and no trouble. For your brilliance, TD, I am grateful. For your skills as a player, I am in awe. And for your friendship, I am honored. Milwaukee Bucks coach and former Spurs assistant Mike Budenholzer said to ESPN's Kevin Arnovitz, the magnitude of that, the number of people in this league who have enjoyed opportunity or found fortunate spots in the league, you can trace it all back to this one guy, to the way Timmy played ball and the way he conducted himself. The culture is Timmy. The NBA is a league of superstars and dynasties. From Russell to Jordan, from Chamberlain to LeBron, we remember its history through its champions. And in the history of North American sports, no one has been as good for as long as the Spurs. San Antonio's success is completely unprecedented in the world of basketball. Aside from his lockout-shortened sophomore season, Duncan won 50 or more games and qualified for the playoffs in every season of his career. He finished his career with a win percentage of 71%, the highest of anyone, in any sport, ever. 
The Spurs' run of success started in 1997, the year they drafted Tim Duncan. Since then, he has been the cornerstone, the engine of the franchise that has perpetually defined what winning culture looks like in and outside of basketball. And so I say again, if you ran a team and you could pick any NBA player from any era of basketball and your goal was to win, you would pick Tim Duncan. His abilities as a basketball player are what made him a superstar. But his consistency, willingness to be coached, love and support of his teammates, and humility are the things that make him transcendent. I'll let Pop have the last word. Here he is after Tim Duncan announced his retirement. You know, everybody always talks about who they like to eat dinner with. You know, if you had one night and you could go to dinner or go to lunch with so-and-so, who would you like to do it with and people say you know mother Teresa and Jesus and the Dalai Lama and uh, okay I get it and and I can honestly tell you uh, my dinner would be with Timmy uh, and it would be because he's the most real consistent true person uh, I've ever met in my life. Hey everybody, this is Clayton. Thank you so much for watching this video. It took a lot of time and effort to make, and like I said in the video, I hope to make this a series where I make the case for seven other players as the GOAT, so I hope you consider subscribing. In the meantime, feel free to check out my website, ballsandsuch.com, where I'll be posting blogs and things like that more regularly. I'm just getting it off the ground, so just bear with me for a bit. It's mostly basketball, but I'll be getting into other sports on there as well, so feel free to check it out. Thanks again.